Hello and welcome back. In this lecture, we'll look at promises that are used for asynchronous operations like making HTTP requests. The ES6 specification added native support for promises to JavaScript. So in this video, I'm covering ES6 promises that you can use in any ES6 code that are not specific to Angular 2. I have a basic Angular 2 application here with a single app component. Now let's add a property, say result, that is a number like 7, and we can display this property in our template in a paragraph saying the result is result with strong emphasis. And after saving this file, the page will display result 7, of course. Now, suppose that we need to calculate this result somehow, like adding 5 and 2, but we need to call some other method to get the result, like an add method that simply returns the sum of x and y that are passed as arguments. So we can initialize result to this add 5 and 2, and we'll still get 7 on the page, of course. This is trivial stuff, but think of the add method as just an example of potentially many different situations. Instead of simply adding numbers, we could have a method that makes an HTTP request to a web API and returns some data that we want to display on the page. The concept is the same. So suppose that the add method needs to be asynchronous where asynchronous means that it doesn't return the result immediately. For example, when making an HTTP request, we need to wait a little bit for the request to be sent over the network and then the server to respond. So how do we pass the result back if we cannot return it immediately? A first approach is to use callbacks. A callback is a function that we accept as a parameter of our method and that we'll call when the result is available. The parameter can be named whatever you like, of course, but I've named it callback to make it clear. So instead of returning the result, we invoke the callback function passing the result, right? Now we need to change the way we call this method, so let's add a constructor and we call this add 5 and 2, and now we need a third argument that is the callback function that will receive the result. The ES6 arrow function syntax is very convenient for these cases. So we take the result and simply assign it to this result that is our property. When I save this file, the page still shows 7, of course. Now, even though we are using a callback, the add method is still not asynchronous because we are calling the callback immediately. So to make this example more realistic, let's add a delay before generating the result. We can use setTimeout for that. We pass a function to setTimeout that takes no parameters and invokes our callback with the result. And as the second argument of set timeout, we specify the delay, say, 100 milliseconds. This is truly asynchronous now. And after saving this file, the page will show 7 after a very short delay. Let's make this delay more visible by timing how long the call takes. So let's add a time property and display the time in our template as a new paragraph saying time colon the time expression. We can calculate the time by initializing a start time variable before we call the add method and set it to date now that returns the current time in milliseconds. Then after we get the result, in addition to setting the result property, we also set this time to be now minus the start time, right? So now we see that it took just over 100 milliseconds. If we change the delay to 500 milliseconds, for example, obviously the page will show 500 odd milliseconds. Let me make the result text bigger just to show that it is the most important part. Good. Now, suppose that 
after we get the result, we need to make another asynchronous call. For example, we want to take the result and add three to get a new result. We can nest the callbacks in this way. And we now get a result of 10 after slightly over 200 milliseconds because it's making two calls one after the other and each call takes about 100 milliseconds. Again, we're just adding numbers in this example to keep things simple, but there are many real world scenarios where we need to make one asynchronous call, wait for the result, then make another call and so on. For example, the first call could be sending login credentials to the server and receive the user details. Then once we have the user details, we make another call to the server, retrieving some other data for that user and so on. So suppose we need to make a third call now. Again, we can nest the callback blocks and let's say we just add one this time. Let's indent the code properly and save the file, and we now get 11 in just over 300 milliseconds, as you would expect. The more calls we need to make, the more nested code blocks we have, and that doesn't look very nice. Now, suppose we need to add some error handling as well. For example, let's say that in our calculation, we cannot have negative results for whatever reason. So we calculate the result as x plus y and we pass this result to the callback but only if the result is greater than or equal to zero. Let me indent this if block. Else, we'll need to add another parameter to our method that is an error callback. So if the result is negative, we invoke the error callback passing a message like invalid value and the result. Now let's display this possible error in our page as well. Let's add an error property and another line to our template showing the error after the text error. So when we call the add method, we now need to pass a second callback to receive the possible error and just assign it to this error. And we need to do that every single time that we call the add method, so three times in this case. Right, there's no error at the moment because the result is never negative. Let's add minus 10 here in the second call. And we now see an error on the page saying invalid value minus 3 because 5 plus 2 is 7, minus 10 is minus 3, of course. So this is what we end up with using callbacks for asynchronous calls. Our code is getting pretty messy and this is actually just a simple example. Let me make a copy of this file so we can look at it again later for comparison. Let's rename it to .cb for callbacks. Now let's go back to our original file and see how we can approach the same problem using promises instead. Let's remove all the calls from the constructor and simplify the add method so that we don't have errors for now. Using promises, we don't want the callback parameters anymore. Instead, we will return a new promise and pass a function to the promise constructor that will receive what is essentially a callback then in the body of this function, we can do exactly the same thing we were doing before. That is call set timeout and after a delay, invoke the callback function passing the result. Now, rather than callback, when working with promises, this function is typically called resolve, as in we are resolving this promise successfully. So in the constructor, we can now call our add method again, but now we don't pass any callbacks. Rather, we get a promise back. It's called promise because we don't get an immediate result, but we get a promise of a result, if you like. We can use the promise to receive the result. This promise object has just two methods, catch and then.
we can get the result by calling then and passing a function that will receive the result. And do the same thing as before, that is assigning result to the this result property and also setting the time property to date now minus start time. And we can see that the page shows seven as the result in just over 100 milliseconds. So far, it's not that different from using callbacks. It's just that instead of passing a callback function to the add method, the add method returns this promise object and we call the then method passing what is essentially our callback function there. Typically, you wouldn't declare a local variable for the promise anyway. You would just call then after calling the method that returns the promise like this. Now, suppose we want to make a second call. You may think that we need to call add here after we get the result of the previous call. So add result n3 and again call the then method and so on. And this would work, but it would also defeat the purpose of using promises. Instead, with promises, we can just add another then step here that receives the result and transforms it by adding result n3. And this new result will be passed on to the next step. That's because the function we passed to then can return another promise. So here we return what calling this add returns, that is a promise, and it will be resolved to the sum of result n3. This is called promise chaining. We are chaining the promise calls one after the other. We're basically saying add five and two, then when you get the result, add three to that, then when you get the final result, assign it to the this result property. Now, if I save this file, you can see that the page shows a result of 10 in just over 200 milliseconds, so it's doing two calls. At this point, adding a third call is very easy. We just need another then step where we add one, for example. And now we get 11 in 300 and something milliseconds, so you can see that our code is already nicer than with callbacks. In TypeScript, we can explicitly declare the return type of this method by saying that it returns a promise of a number. Promise is a generic interface and we can parameterize it specifying what type of result it will resolve to, in this case, a number. Notice that in the function we pass to a then step, we can return another promise that will be chained, or we can return nothing, like in the final then step, where we just do some assignments, we're not returning anything, or at least we're not interested in what we return. There are also other options. We could return an immediate result instead of another promise. So here we could return result plus one without calling our asynchronous add method. And now we still get 11 as the result, but it only took 200 milliseconds because it only made two asynchronous calls and not three like before. Also, we're always using a number at the moment, but there's nothing stopping us from returning a different type of result if we like. For example, we could return a string like repeat the asterisk character as many times as the value of the result from the previous step. So now the page shows a string of 10 asterisks because five plus two is seven plus three is 10. So at each step, we can transform the result from the previous step into a new result that may or may not be of the same type and maybe an immediate result, or maybe a promise of a result. Now, what about error handling? Let's see how to generate an error if the result is negative, like before. So we add a local result variable, and if result is greater than or equal to zero, 
we call resolve with the result. Else, we need to call a different function and we can get it as the second parameter of the function we pass to the promise constructor. It's usually called reject. So if result is negative, we call reject with an error message saying invalid value result like before. Good. Now what happens if we add minus 10 in the second step? We get an exception in the console saying uncaught exception in promise invalid value minus 3. Now it's good that the error is logged even if we didn't log it explicitly ourselves, but how can we handle this error in our code? Well, here's another benefit of promises. We can handle any errors happening at any step of the promise chain by calling the catch method as the last step. So here we receive the error and we simply assign it to the this error property. And now the page shows error invalid value minus three. So no matter when the error occurs, we can catch it in a single place without the need to add error handling to each single step. However, if we do want to catch the error for a specific step, we can do that as well. Let's say we want to explicitly handle the error caused by adding minus 10. We will get the error in the next step in the chain. So here we can pass a second function to the then method, receive the error, and if we want, recover the situation. For example, let's say that in this case, we want to return zero and continue anyway, for whatever reason. As you can see, the final result is now zero because we default to that value instead of propagating the error. Now, when we do have an error reaching the end of the chain, we have a small problem in that we don't see the time on the page because the step where we set the time property is skipped. When an error occurs, processing will go straight to the catch step. We had the same problem with callbacks as well, but with promises, it's easier to fix. We can add another then step after the catch step, and here we don't expect any result, so we leave the parameter list empty, but we can set the time property and remove it from the earlier step. So now we see both the error and the time that is 200 milliseconds because it made two asynchronous calls. Then the error occurred and it skipped the third call. So now we might as well save some lines by moving the assignment of the result property. And just to check, Let's add 3 again instead of minus 10 to make sure everything still works when there are no negative results. Good. Now let's compare this code that uses promises with our initial version of the code using callbacks. Let's put the two files side by side. Let me expand this window and scroll to the bottom part of each file. There you go. I'm sure you'll agree that promises make the code a lot cleaner, more elegant, easier to understand. They're also more powerful thanks to the way you can combine promises together. They're just a much better approach to asynchronous code compared to callbacks. So that's all for now and I'll see you later.